Hi, I'm Bernie Meyerson. I'm the VP of Innovation here at IBM, and um, I'd like to tackle some of the questions to the uh, Reddit post we put up. So starting, uh, we took basically an assembly of the uh, questions. We tried to pick the top 10, as we said we would. And I hope these are representative in your judgment, but we did our best. But I'm going to start with the obvious one, and this is actually a very clever one from uh, Captain Chicken, which basically said, how do you feel about your track record of the last five years? Now, um, rather than go through the last five years' worth of these things, which 25 of them, which would take forever, what I did was we went back to 2006, and I just said, okay, you know, we've had five years. How did we do? So I'm going to do a real quick uh, pass at these. Um, the first prediction was, Basically, you can access healthcare anywhere, anytime, any place, with rapid speed, and from anywhere in the world. Not just when I say anywhere in your home, or to it, literally, you know, sitting on the side of a mountain in K two and K two. That actually has come to pass. As many of you know, there's something called telemedicine out there. They've had uh, capabilities where, in fact, you can do surgery remotely if you have to using robotics. It's not uh, necessarily a daily occurrence, but telemedicine is very well known at this time because the bandwidth available almost universally, even if you have to resort to sat phone, is more than adequate for doing EKGs and EEGs and other diagnostics. So we hit very, very well on that one. The second one talked about cell phones uh, reading your mind in the sense not of what we're talking about today's current uh, prediction, but rather what we called at that point location-based services. And that is pervasive. Again, that one is a dead-on hit. If you think about it, there are many services now, which if you're on a various services powered through the GPS of your phone, you press the talk button and you say Starbucks or whatever. And presto, you have the location of the nearest Starbucks and how to get your caffeine fix in short order. So again, location-based services evolved to become just absolutely pervasive today. And so again, that one was a good call. Um, Real-time speech translation. Uh, now, this is really along the lines for those of you who are as, the, you know, as old as I am. The original Star Trek had something they called the universal translator. You know, it's a little sucker you put in your ear and somebody speaks to you in Klingon and you understand them in English. Well, the bottom line is that actually does exist. It is not pervasive. So, you know, that one isn't a five for five on a, in the sense of, you know, five being a perfect score. Maybe it's a three and a half or four out of five. And the reason, of course, is it isn't pervasive, but it does exist. We've built these things for special applications. Others have. If you go on the web, these things exist. You have text, speech to text. You have text to text in other languages. It actually is beginning to evolve, and you'll see it, I think, pervasively in some period of time shortly. In the gaming industry, of course, we have online multinational games. So it's coming, and again, it was a decent prediction, but it hasn't evolved fully, so you don't get full credit on something like that. The 3D Internet was another prediction, and this was really the notion of an immersive experience, a la Second Life and other things of that nature. That has not emerged to any extent that one might have thought it would in that time five years ago. Again, it's not pervasive. But it is out there. In fact, immersive environments are emerging in places we simply, I guess, hadn't pursued. As an example, in the theater, 3D movies are essentially so commonplace today that you'd be hard put to find a theater that doesn't offer them. In fact, you can get them in your home. So the immersive environment, instead of actually emerging as we had thought in a commercial environment, actually emerged in the entertaining environment. But nonetheless, it's out there. So that was pretty good. That's probably three or four out of five on that five scale. So again, pretty close. Um, the last one we, we actually nailed, which was we said that nanotechnology would emerge as a very important part of what you were doing in terms of environmental uh, and environmental sensing. These are literally single atom, single atomic layer, single molecular layer based devices that had sort of magic properties in the environment. And they've emerged in too long a list of applications to even uh, call out, but just one of them for examples is you can have a uh, surface layer of one particular molecule that is hypersensitive to a toxin that you're looking for. So if you want a sense for pollution in the environment, you literally have the surface layer that acts as an atta as a um, attachment site for the bad stuff you're looking for, and when that stuff attaches, it triggers an electronic device underneath that signals you this is a problem. These are hugely sensitive sensors that are very, very cheap, so you can deploy large numbers of them. And they're in standard use, as are many, many other things based on nano. So we actually have had a decent track record. You tend to get 60 to 80 percent of these right. And what I remind people is, remember, we're predicting stuff that is, at the time you make the prediction, often very far out. And so uh, the fact of the matter is, if you get all of them right all the time, you're not trying hard enough. And similarly, you know, you'll never be a leader if you don't occasionally fail. Right? You show me somebody who never fails, takes no risk, they'll also never lead. 
So you do have to hang out there a bit, and I would say that's a pretty good record. Now, there's another question right behind that. It's from uh, Zaffo Biebs. It says, what about 3D printing or home fabrication in general, like laser cutters, mills, and will it become a large market or remain a hobbyist and a specialist uh, capability? Again, this isn't something that IBM per se is engaged in, but my personal opinion as a technologist is that you will have the ability, and you do have it today, quite honestly, on a commercial basis, to do 3D milling and special creation of uh, objects. But no, that's not the sort of thing where, again, in reference to some of the more science fiction-y uh, ideas, where you have a fabricator where you just say, you know, make me a pretzel, and poof, there's a pretzel. Now, rearranging atoms is a bit far out. You know, laser milling and all is also still pretty far out. It's a specialist kind of hobby thing. I certainly, within 20, 30 years, I would expect the cost of such things to come down significantly. But no, I really don't see it becoming a, a pervasive capability. 3D printing on the other hand, and 3D visualization is becoming pervasive already. That's something, like I said, you can just buy a TV and a set of glasses, some don't even require them now. And handsets, in fact, are now being shown that don't require uh, special 3D optics uh, as well. So things like that are coming, but beyond that, no, this has got a ways to go. As far as the next one, uh, Veni VD Vixi uh, asks basically, um, it has, it's a t they ask a tough question. I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase it, which is we have a whole series of predictions, one, two, three, five, related to mobile technology, related to security, related to all sorts of capabilities. And to net out the question being asked here, it is if you have this capability, for instance, to do multifaceted analytics and actually on a person's image analyze whether there's a match to the visual capability of what match to your voice print, and use these kinds of capabilities to identify you. Biometrics and multiple biometrics are a very powerful thing. And the concern being expressed here is, doesn't this empower people to identify you when you lose your anonymity? It's sort of netting it out. It is a risk, but remember there's a flip side. If you look right now, people hijack your identity and make a mess of your life for quite a bit of time. You know, the 99.99999% of the people out there that are great people and would never even think of doing this are wonderful, but the 0.00001% that are out there who'd like to swipe your identity and empty all your bank accounts, they're a real problem, and you want to make their life as miserable as possible. The fact is, many people do not do well with today's methods of identification, which is to say passwords, and I guarantee you could find friends who carry their list of passwords around in their pocket. This is not a good idea. Um, if you look, the article right now in the current Consumer Reports, in fact, discusses the astounding number of people who do things like this. The trick is you have to be able to have an alternative. Nobody's saying you must use these identities. In fact, the fact is the biometrics right now, you can actually, within I would say five years, which is the prediction, have enough power in your hand device that it will identify you using multiple biometrics. You don't have to share those biometrics with anyone else. Once that device knows you are you, it is vouching for you on a very secure network. So it's not about losing your anonymity. You still have it as long as you've restricted the actual biometrics to your local device. And you have the option to not do so. I'm perfectly happy having my biometrics available. So if somebody tries to open a credit card my name, in my name at a, at a store, it basically takes one look at them and says, yeah, but you know, your mustache is off or whatever. So it's up to you. This is something that's an individual choice. I do understand and, and certainly recognize the concern expressed, but there are issues you're trying to address and you have to pick, frankly, among those. There's another question from Apocalypsum. <laughs> it's an interesting one. It says, uh, what does your position, VP of Innovation, precisely do? I've seen a lot of VPs of Innovation recently and it seems a fairly underspecified position. Um, exactly. Quite frankly, that's the idea. One of the dangers of most companies, uh, most companies, especially large companies, face is you become siloed. You literally are incredibly deep in one area, but you have no breath, which makes you very effective in this incredibly tiny space. Well, the world isn't tiny anymore. The world is indeed flat, and it's global. What you would like is to have people in an organization who really make a point of taking the entire vertical world and turning it horizontal. So the skills of the people they bring in, obviously one person doesn't have them all, but their team they create covers this incredibly broad expanse, literally from A to Z. We're talking in technology from atoms and molecules and building things all the way out to the actual global ecosystem you create that supports all of this in terms of software and hardware. 
that built ecosystem is very powerful, but it can only be done by folks who are charged with that level of innovation and have that open field running capability. It has resulted in many cases in some really amazing breakthroughs because you're not restricted to one set of metrics. You have to produce. This is There's no free lunch here. But what people are saying is go forth and do good stuff on the faith that you have a long enough track record of having done it and having created the teams that do it. It's never, never about one person. It's about being able to really leverage the resources and make things happen. I mean, I'll give you one example, um, a very quick one. If you go back to November of 2003, you'll find a press release with the name uh, Meyerson and Microsoft in it, which is kind of odd. The truth is that that was the beginnings of Xbox 360, as everybody, of course, now knows, where the microprocessor elements inside of that come from IBM. That effort in gaming and other efforts that also took us into Sony's PlayStation, into the Nintendo Wii, those involved a huge amount of innovation, which even to this day we can't specify. But again, that's why you do things in this horizontal manner, to be able to tackle industries you didn't even have a presence in early before. So moving on, um, rubber mensch. Uh, will never needing a password again tend to kill anonymity? The answer actually is you choose. As I said in the earlier response, getting rid of the password can be something that you have an opt-in, opt-out capability for. But I will tell you today's system doesn't work. The amount of hacking that goes on, the ability for people to take your identity and do unpleasant things with it, tells you that the current system is broken. And although we'd all love to stay where we are, and it's great if you can be completely anonymous, you do have to ask yourself the question, which is, is that the best total outcome for me personally? And you can make that choice. The fact is, what we're talking about, though, here in this particular set of ideas is not making necessarily all of your biometrics pervasively available, but rather the way in which you can use biometrics to validate with absolute assuredness that you are who you say you are at a local device. Now, beyond that, you're right. There's a huge question about how much of that biometric capability you want to go upstream. That's a different topic. And it's not, you know, the question of total uh, loss of anonymity. There is, it's not something you can answer simply here because that's a much deeper than a technical question. But we're very well aware of that issue. It's something, nonetheless, that the current system isn't working. And we need to do something. So we're offering up some ideas, and clearly there are other ideas that will be out there that compete with it. We're fine with that.